We will go in and destroy systematically the hardened military targets with airstrikes. And the thousands of troops in Zimbabwe will stand no mechanism and no real opposition to the combined forces of the SADC, the ANU, and the United Nations. We believe this should be followed up with a massive international aid package and the presence of peacekeepers in the nation until free and fair elections can be held and a transition to a stable society can be guaranteed. And we expect this will be long term. We expect peacekeepers will be there for five to ten years, in much the same way as ECO once did in Liberia and Sierra Leone successfully. Why do we think it's necessary to act? Because we think that sovereignty is not an absolute. And the government of Robert Mugabe has given up any claim that it had to be the sovereign leader of its nation. We think that sovereignty is a historical artifact that is just there to help governments work in the international arena and more importantly to help governments recognise the will of the people. Well, we think Robert Mugabe has broken the criteria that are necessary for us to respect sovereignty. The first of these is that there is a humanitarian crisis in Zimbabwe that is unresponded to or actively furthered by the government of that nation. And in just the same way as we accept that there is a principle to act in the case of genocide, we think likewise that allowing poverty, famine and disease to spread and actively putting policies in place to encourage that should be considered just as much a crime against the people of that country. The second reason is that sovereignty should only be recognised by the international community when a government has a claim to represent the will of the people. We don't think this actually means perfect democracy. We're more than happy to say that in many cases, governments like China do a very good job of representing the will for economic development of the vast majority of their people. But in Zimbabwe, this is clearly not the case. In the most recent poll that was conducted, only 18% said they would support Robert Mugabe, 32% said Changarai, and 40% were so terrorised by Robert Mugabe's forces that they didn't comment, because that is the degree of fear that is held. More than this, power sharing has been an absolute unadmissible failure in Zimbabwe. The solution that the international community tried was to get MDC and Morgan Changarai to share power in a peaceful, happy Nirvana with Robert Mugabe. The result has been that Mugabe has kept power has kept control of every major ministry, including defence, home affairs, interior ministry and finance, in such a way as to strangle the control of every other. We think the government is not acting in a crisis and doesn't respect the will of the people. The third reason why sovereignty can be cut out is because all other methods have been tried and failed. We've tried everything. The South Africa sent Thabo Mbeki to negotiate with Robert Mugabe in an attempt to get him to set down. It didn't work. We put sanctions as a broad sense on Zimbabwe. It didn't work. And we don't think that it should be the case of sanctions used because they hurt the people on the ground in Zimbabwe most of all. We think that targeted sanctions on senior Zimbabwe ministers have again been tried and failed. So why is our solution the one that will work to restore power in Zimbabwe? The main reason is we believe, firstly, that amnesty backed up with a credible threat is incredibly likely to succeed. The reason that Robert Mugabe did accept the amnesty in 2000 that Kofi Annan offered him was because there was no reason to think that it would be thrust out by force. We changed that. But secondly, this invasion would work. Before I talk about it, sir. If you basically oppose sanctions because they cause loss of damage to innocent poor people, how is launching a land invasion in any way to the answer is that the combined forces of South Africa and the United Nations are vastly technologically superior to the underfed and under-equipped forces of Zimbabwe. This will be a quick and clean military action. This is classic army versus army warfare, which the West and its allies in South Africa is very strong in this regard, know how to do well. The problem you might be thinking about is protracted insurgency post the initial thing, like we got in Iraq. The initial conflict there was clean, not many civilians died. We got stuck in an insurgency afterwards. Well, the difference here is that the hearts and minds of the Zimbabwean people are on the side of the liberators who liberate them from the Mugabe, making the promises of liberation into greater oppression than ever before. And those poll statistics I gave you before are indicative. 
The other reason why we think we won't get the same drawn out conflict is because we think our post-conflict handling will be much better than Afghanistan or Iraq for a couple of reasons. The first of these is that we'll hold elections quickly and there is a credible opposition ready to take power. In a few times, January did have some influence. He brought about an end to inflation and restored the economy before Mugabe rolled those back and took control again. Secondly, this will bring about a total lift of sanctions and as our policy said, massive economic engagement. The problem is donors don't want to donate to Robert Mugabe and Zimbabwe right now. And this will open the floodgates for America and India to rapidly develop the country and fix it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a solution that can work because the armed conflict will be over quickly and we have a clear, credible opposition that post-development will happen effectively. way. But more than that, it's something we have to do for the people of Zimbabwe and for the people of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. 
tight enough as an incredibly strong interest in retaining control and retaining influence in that field. It's been willing to give the Zimbabwe military, oftentimes it's very technologically advanced weaponry. We don't think that's going away given the existence of the enormous numbers of violence around it. Secondly, within yeah. this point, we tend to be soldiers of viciously loyal to Robert Mugabe. Firstly, for ideological reasons, but secondly, because they fear prosecution by the international community for massacres in Matabele land in the 1980s. We're looking at people yeah. like Robert Chizenga, who's the current de defense force commander. These people aren't going to give up without a fight. Lastly, we tend to be well trained. They have a long history of oppression. But now let's look at this notion that we're just going to be welcomed with open arms as liberators before I do it, take close. It's not that the Zimbabweans aren't ready for democracy. Robert Mugabe has stolen elections from them. It's that Robert Mugabe isn't ready for democracy. Okay, Ron, what I'm going to get to in my second point is that we think Robert Mugabe is going to be dead quite soon, and the costs of the long civil war are unlikely to be worth overthrowing a man who's about to die. But let's talk briefly about why we're not going to be greeted as liberators. Because we tend to use Zimbabwe as an ethnically divided country. Mugabe is owned to Zuru people who are the same ethnic group as Emerson or Nangawa, one of the contenders to take his place at the head of ZANU, benefits strongly, no thanks, madam, from the absence, uh, from the absence of democracy in that country. We think they're likely to fight back. We think this is likely to send into a civil war. No thanks, guys. Why do we tell you this is bad? Firstly, we think it just leads to mass death. Secondly, we think it's for the destruction of infrastructure. Thirdly, we think it's likely to cause regional conflict. And fourthly, as Hugh is going to tell you, we think it damages the long-term prospect of democracy. What that shows you is that even a return to Zanu PF rules is better than a long, bloody civil war played out between international troops and within Zimbabwe itself that will kill millions of people. Especially given that we don't think we're going to get a return to Zanu. Why is that? What are the alternatives? Firstly, we tell you that Mugabe is about to die. He is old and he is frail. We point out that the Juru Gugangawa power within Zanu to take his place at the head of that party is already going on. What does that mean? We think it means that Zanu PF, which currently does hold the reins of power, is likely to become much weaker very soon. Both sides of that have already approached the movement for democratic change to be involved in the post-election, in the post-transition coalition with them. We think at the point at which ZANU stops to fragment, that is much more likely to bring about peaceful change and allow the MPC to take power. Moreover, we tell you that even in the context of oppression they want to talk about, the Zimbabwean Election Commission announced that the MPC got 48% of the vote at the last Zimbabwean election. We don't think this is a regime that has such total control of its population and of its electoral system that it's going to be able to permanently resist motions for democratic change. That's exactly why Zanu had to enter in to power share. Lastly, what we tell you is that their policy does just completely ignore the fact that the international community does have a whole range of alternatives. We think it's a lie to say that sanctions have been leveled very heavily on Zimbabwe. We think we've made a mistake oftentimes of not being vicious and not being tough enough in trying to bring about internal democratic change. What we tell you is now we have an astonishing moment to achieve the possibility of peaceful democratic change in Zimbabwe when faced with the harms of a long, bloody and brutal civil war. We think that's probably quite a good thing. We're very proud to oppose. Thank you.
And he celebrated that by saying, we just have to tighten it up a bit more, guys. Well, aside from the fact that that's clearly not going to happen in the context of China, we think that's more morally reprehensible for Zimbabweans on the ground. He's right that there was temporary improvement in the standard of living in Zimbabwe. But the very clear context that Victor gave you was the idea that we are sliding backwards, was the idea that the power sharing agreement is not going forward as planned, and the idea that elections on the horizon are just another attempt to falsely consolidate power by Mugabe. So let's look at the second idea about the nature of conflict. Firstly, we'd like to point out that if we accept his characterization that Mugabe is unstable, and if we also acknowledge that maybe those of us in the room are not able to accurately predict the date at which he might die, then we have to acknowledge the idea that he probably won't negotiate with the assertions that he claimed that he would. If he is unstable, if he is nepotistic, if he does like consolidating his power, then tell me why he would care about an idea of a power sharing deal or a negotiation or a fair election. The reason is that you can't tell us because he simply wouldn't because of your very own characterization. And we heard the idea that, well, if sanctions are bad, we think invasion is worse. That was just an assertion. Victor spent a lot of time in today's debate explaining the relative advantage that we have militarily over the military that we have in Zimbabwe here from the members that would become involved. We think an analogy can be drawn with Iraq, where the initial invasion was very swift. Where we can distinguish this from Iraq is the idea that with Iraq there was not a ready group to take over, and there also wasn't the idea that there wasn't the same level of ethnic tensions in this country. We think that the power sharing issues in Zimbabwe are power sharing based. They're not ethnic tensions that lead to the same type of drawn out conflict in places like Iraq. We say even if there were high levels of death in the instance, we think that that is a relative harm that we are prepared to bear, not only for the sake of South Africa, but for Zimbabwe, but for the, for the sake of the rest of Africa. He asserted that a civil war would flow on, and I've already dealt with this idea, that firstly the dispute is not ethnically based, it is power based, but secondly the idea that an amnesty, which can easily be extended to rank and file members of Zanu Pia, incentivizes the idea for them to come forward. And he acknowledged that in part in his speech where he said they don't really support Zanu Pia, they're prepared to go with someone else. So if that's the case, then they would be supportive of this proposal. What I want to look at in my speech is some discussion about democracy in Africa. Because we think a failure to act in these countries is having a paralyzing effect. I want to look at this in two ways. Firstly, in terms of the trend of pro-democracy, and secondly, the idea of a failure to act in future. So at the moment, we think there is a damaging trend in Africa. We think there is a trend to hold elections, to take control of power in a legitimate way, but then to hold on to those elections and to rig them so that you can consolidate the power into the future. Now, the historic solution to this has been power sharing, which we see is clearly failing and holding insufficient here. Let's look at the power sharing agreement that we have in Zimbabwe. Mugabe has defence, home affairs, foreign affairs, mining, agriculture, resettlement, justice, media, and finance. Like, that's a pretty good job. What does Changra have? He has health, he has labour, he has water, he has the public service. And whilst that might make us all feel good in here as left-wing pinkos, we don't think it actually makes Zimbabwe go round. It doesn't allow him to affect any genuine change on the outcome. And the assertion that Chiang Rai isn't supportive of this is a false one. Chiang Rai has called explicitly for the AU and the Southern African Development Community to intervene in the same way that they have in Cote d'Ivoire. Yes, sir. African militants, they can dig in when faced with international invasion, which is exactly why invasions in the DRC and Somalia were. Why won't the same thing happen again? Because the extent of the support for those types of institutions and those governments was vastly different to the context of Zimbabwe. When Victor told you that Zanapia is not popular on the ground, when he told you that Mugabe is only popular in a superficial way, we wholly believe that this is a totally different context in this debate. So this idea of holding faux elections is designed to consolidate power and to create a false idea of democracy. And an example can be found in Cote d'Ivoire, where we see Laurent Gbagbo has stolen power from the opposition leader there and continues to hold on to it through the Constitutional Court. This policy, where an absence to act, allows this inaction to continue. What this policy does is it actually stops something like an election being held in Zimbabwe, which is scheduled for later on in this year, which allows Mugabe to consolidate his power even further. And especially in the context of a not very connected country, in a country that is not highly educated, it's very easy to manipulate the will of the people there in this respect. So the opportunity for an election is dire and something that we need to stop. So let's look at the second element of this. Because I think invasion is the worst case scenario, and we're happy to admit that. But we think that you need to strengthen the most extreme ends of engagement with these countries in order to make these softer parts of it more effective. So let's look at the spectrum. You can write an angry letter to someone. 
You can maybe cut them off from the party of a diplomatic function. You can slap sanctions on them or you can invade them. And the only reason why people take the initial stages seriously is because there's a genuine threat of it at the end of the world. And Africa's failure to act and to emphasise that there is a genuine threat at the end of the road only undermines previous efforts that avoid the invasions that they wanted to talk about. This policy sends a message to leaders like Bashir in Sudan, to Islamists in Somalia, that we are serious when we say that you can't rig elections. Mr Speaker, at the end of our case, what we told you very clearly is that we're not prepared to cross our fingers and hope that, uh, that Mugabe kicks the bucket. But more importantly, that even if that was the case, it's inappropriate for us to sit back and wait on the sidelines for this problem to get worse. Civil war and long term democracy. About and by them failing to wait just a little bit longer, a little bit longer for the change that will come, they risk jeopardizing the chances of democracy in Zimbabwe for a generation. And why that's a problem. Before that, some are problem. So, firstly, if you like to characterize our cases, well, we're just going to wait, sit back, cross our fingers, and hope for M Mugabe to die. Perhaps he has a long life expectancy, but he's nearly at the end of it, Mr. Speaker. And more importantly, they are wrong to like, implicitly characterize Zanu PF as a homogenous force. In fact, there are plenty within the Zanu PF party who want to form and want to work with Morgan Chamber. We tell you that Joyce Majuru, like, the, current, the current vice president of the Zanu PF party and a member um, of, of uh, Mugabe's Zazaru ethnic group, is one of the leading figures in this, in this struggle. He controls the grassroots, um, the grassroots campaign of the Zanu PF party. Currently, he has been zoned out of higher levels of government. But people like this, people who are high up in the Zanu PF party, are in favour of reform. He has explicitly told the world that he wants a second, um, a second power sharing government, and that he supports working with Morgan Schreiber. Right? All of these groups become polarised against, um, against further reform when you do something like this. When you invade, when you get rid of them militarily, that's a massive problem. The next thing she does is talk again about sovereignty. What we tell you here is that she seems to misunderstand Ben's point. We think this is a legitimate invasion. We just think it's a bad one. We think it's going to be fair. Um, Wait, sir. No. No, thank you. Um, the next thing she says is, well, the, the, the um, Zimbabwean army doesn't really have any money from diamonds. First we false, at least according to our matter file. And second, we tell you generally, no thank you, what we tell you generally is like the only way that Mugabe has managed to stay in power is by bringing all these awful things to his people for decades is because he's gone really, really good at war. He's gone really, really good at building up a tightly controlled army, no thank you, which is intensely loyal to him, no thank you. And the fact that there exists opposition movements in Zimbabwe argues in favour of this argument. I was in favour of the fact that even then he's managed to maintain control because of the incredibly effective military. Um, the next thing they tell you is, um, well, is the Democrat, um, the movement for Democrat, um, the movement for Democrat change hasn't had much buy in, uh, hasn't had much power in the no thank you power sharing governments. First, we tell you they have a minister, we tell you things like the provision of services, control of the public services, these are not irrelevant things, these are massive steps forward in Zimbabwe. Again, things that you jeopardise when you, when you endorse this engagement. No thank you. She tells you that. Well, there's no support for the for the Zimbabwean government, and that's and that's the reason why it's different from Iraq, or whatever. We're not going to claim that there's like mass public support on the part of like, the population of Zimbabwe generally, but another way in which Mugabe has maintained in power is by consistently enriching loyal ethnic groups. No, thank you. His own Zimbabwean people, who have, who haven't done particularly badly out of his rule, at least relative to other actors within that state. 
These are the people, these are the reason why he's able to maintain control like, at the moment. And these are the people who will aid in insurgency, who will like, continue fight against invading forces, and will see themselves as losing out under any invasion. That's a problem, because quick, violent change is most likely to be opposed by the people who lose out. No thank you. She tells you about the message that this sends. What we tell you very simply is one, we can send the message that we're in favour of, 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 um, of democracy through other methods, like sanctions, like support for governments, no thank you. And secondly, that this is going to fail. And the only message it sends then is that we like, we like to support democracy, but you're like, we're not very good at it, so uh, keep doing what you're doing. No thank you. So, um, what am I going to talk about in terms of the Firstly, intervention. Why it's likely to fail, building on Ben's analysis. What we tell you here is that African Union intervention has a lot, and an international intervention generally in Africa, has a very long history of failure. So, Why is this? For several reasons. Right? So, thank you. Firstly, because often individual armies, particularly at the level of like non commissioned officers and soldiers and like lower down um, commissioned officers, don't share the same incentives as the groups who are, who are, sending, in the, who are sending in the armies. You know, thank you. So, for example, a lot of South African soldiers get incredibly rich of the proceeds of Zimbabwean diamond mines in Morongo. I think that's right. Um, no, thank you. So, the, like, on the level of individual soldiers, there's often an incentive not to fight as hard as possible, perhaps to sabotage the effort. That's problematic. Secondly, because we see significant empirical evidence of home credit advantage, something Ben talked about, um, on the part of African armies in previous interventions. That's why, it, because it's because it's very difficult to counter people when they're dug in, when they're taken, when they're able to like melt back into the communities from which they come. No, thank you. When they just know the lay of the land better than everyone else. Again, we see empirical evidence of this. Look, for example, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a theoretically like technologically superior force let, was still mired in ten years of dug-in violent conflict that killed ten, like that killed millions and millions of people, and was one of the most horrific incidents in modern African history. Go. On one hand, you say that Zenith Pierre will fight tooth and nail to hold power and resist an invasion that they have no hope of winning. On the other hand, you're saying that they're going to roll over and they're just going to accept negotiations or fair elections. Which one's more likely? Sorry, like, there's no contradiction, right? We think, like, broadly speaking, the type of, of change that they are more likely to accept is one in which they work through negotiation and are able to maintain some amount of power, right? This is why people within Zanotia who see that Mugabe and the, and the, far, and the like, extremists within that party have led their country to ruin are in favour of negotiating with Morgan Stranger, right? Because they think they might benefit from a stable Zimbabwe and from a, from a wealthy Zimbabwe as much as anyone else. But when you go in and fight a war against Zanotia, then people in Zanotia like, are less likely to be happy. No thank you. What we tell you also um, is that like, the extent of support for invasion is important. What we tell you is that, like, the, in particular, when a colonial narrative can be formed against invading armies who are, like, who are associated with foreign powers, with potentially divergent interests to Zimbabwe, that's problematic. And at the very least, Robert Mugabe's own ethnic groups have been, made, um, have been enriched significantly as a result of this war. So secondly, ladies and gentlemen, civil war and long-term democracy. What's the problem here? Several things. Firstly, we tell you that civil war is likely to fall along, when, when civil war takes place, it's likely to fall along ethnic lines. This is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, because like, when, when there's like a, a war between different ethnic groups, you get ethnic cleavage between those groups. You get a situation where they're less likely to want to work together in future, in future negotiations. That's worse when there's been a war and loads of people have died. Secondly, because like, those people who've been fighting against the invasion have also been fighting against democracy and against whatever institutions are put in place as a result of the, of the um, invasion. That's, a, that's likely to reduce their level of buy-in after the invasion works, even if it succeeds. Secondly, we tell you that a civil war where different parties are driven against each other massively problematizes any narrative of national unity, right? If people work together, the ZANU-PF and the Movement for Democratic Change are seen as having forged the, the new state together, people, people from all groups are more likely to want to support it. That falls apart at the point when you have a war and one side to next to another. Finally, you get the formation and emphasis of violent groups within the state. These are people who aren't going to go away after your invasion takes place. They're going to make democracy harder to make work. So, ladies and gentlemen, for those of those reasons, Ben and I are very, very happy to join us. Right, thank the speaker for his speech and invite the first speaker from closing government, Unicis in the Union, Timuni.
ladies and gentlemen, there was a bizarre assumption from the opening opposition that the same people that they said were, control, were controlling the country now through military means, were terrorizing the people, that the same people in the zone of PF that they said were going to fragment would give up power peacefully at some unspecified point in the future, just so long as we waited. What our extension is going to be about is the way that real internal transfers of power happen, which is violent, which is characterized by regimes that become more extreme as they try to hang on to power, and which is characterized by democratic groups that become undemocratic and populaces that resent the West more and more as sanctions hurt them more and more, destroying the potential for long-term change in Zimbabwe. But before we get on to that, I want to extend a couple of other planks in the bottle first. Firstly, there'll be a long civil war. Here are some facts about the military in Zimbabwe. It has four tanks. And they're from North Korea. In contrast to pick a country in Africa at random, South Africa has 167 of them and it has an arms deal with the United States. Zimbabwe has 29,000 troops. South Africa, again, to pick just one country, has 103,000 and has that kind of support from other countries. It's not 24% of GDP that Zimbabwe spends, it's 5%, and even if it is 24%, then 24% of essentially nothing, which it is now. <laughs> Secondly, this team said the support of the South African military is built on payments. That is true of Zimbabwe, but not of South Africa. The support of the Zimbabwean military is built on patronage from the, uh, the Zano PM. Firstly, they're less supportive now because their pay is worthless now that each Zimbabwean dollar is, uh, now that each Zimbabwean dollar um, is worth 143, 143 million to the US dollar. And secondly, once it becomes obvious that that patronage is going away really, really soon, the reason to fight is gone. Because there is no ideological basis behind Zano PM. There is just money and patronage and corruption. But thirdly, we'd say that our opening half told you that one of the problems with Iraq was that there was no one to take over in Iraq and no new government. They were somewhat right about that. Where they were wrong was that there were clearly established opposition groups, like large Shia groups with clear leaderships, like a 10,000 strong Shia army that were radically anti-Western, that do not exist in Zimbabwe, that are not there to prevent the kind of crisis we had in Iraq. Fourthly, they told us that the colonial narrative is a bit difficult when you've got the ANC on the side. And fourthly, they told us that there'd be long-term democracy will be hurt by this. We're going to tell you why long-term democracy is hurt by conflicts that drag on. Secondly, we heard alternatives. The first of those was waiting. We heard that there is a leader who controls the grassroots of Zone PF who will help us. That grassroots doesn't exist when Zone PF has a support of 10 to 18 percent of the population. The only support that does exist is from a military that will cling to the patronage networks it has as much as possible against an unarmed people and can only be uprooted by someone who can get rid of those patronage networks. But what's more, waiting doesn't work when the MDC has no weapons, has no internal military power and no ability, even with vast popular support, nearly 90% at the moment, to actually demand change. The second option is sanctions, and I'm going to talk in our extension about why they're so bad. So our extension is about why these long drawn out changes of power that often involve military struggles are so bad for countries like this. First reason, because the changeover of power makes these countries worse. We heard Robert Mugabe is old, we heard that he will die. We will acknowledge that people die. What happens? What happens when they do? What we heard was you get fragmentation of the ruling party that makes them more powerful. Here's what really happens, and it has happened in African states where the ruling party's power has broken down and you get a power vacuum. You get various different elements in that party taking up arms in order to control the nation and control the country and citizens being poor in the past. And for a group that only has support from the military, that is precisely what will happen. When you've got precisely the generals that they talked about who have specific interests in power remaining in their hands, not wanting to be victims of other generals who might stream them up by landmines. But you also get a situation, secondly, where you get crackdowns by the ruling party to attempt to entrench their power. So I'm going to talk about more in a second. And the third, the most important problem in why it makes it worse, is because you get Democrats who turn to war. Here's what happens under the opposition's model. The NBC gets so sick of being murdered, I'll take you in one second, gets so sick of being murdered, gets so sick of being attacked, gets so sick, despite the fact that they've got a power sharing agreement, their wives being kidnapped and murdered, that they decide to take up arms. Go ahead. If all these are universal features of internal military regimes changing, why are none of them present in the transition between Fidel, Terrell, and Castro? 
I'm sorry, I didn't actually do that. Um, I'll take that from you. Go ahead, just if, just the, the if these are universal features of internal changes among military regimes, why are none of them found in the transition between Fidel to Raul Castro? Because we're always his brother. And he's... <laughs> when the NBC is forced to fight. Two things. One, they win worse than the forces of the whole world at large do. They win with more deaths because it is more likely that the entire PF will believe that they can win the fight. They win with more deaths because it is more likely that fight will go on in the streets between various different warring elements because there are more factions. But thirdly, we think they become a worse ruling party in the future because they have sold out to military elements that are then part of the basis for their support. So we think, for instance, that if Nelson Mandela had not taken support as a peaceful leader, but with the continued support of Nkonto and Sisway, that South Africa would be, a, would be a worse country because that new democracy would be beholden to military leaders at its very birth. And that's exactly why Robert Mugabe was such a bad leader. Because rather than the Musarima regime taking shape in Zimbabwe, as it should have in a real democratic election taking place in 1980, you had Robert Mugabe beholden to military leaders that he had to keep propping up. Second arm of our extension. Regimes with nothing to lose hurt people in a way at least equivalent to the harms of war. They don't want war. Why? Because it destroys infrastructure. That's what's happening now, when there's no tax dollars being created to keep it up, and when there's no roads to get things to people, and when the very engineers that should be getting bit through to people aren't there. That's what happens when weed is dying on the, on the whatever weed grows on. You also get increasingly irrational policies by governments that are trying to hold on, that strike out at wider and wider portions of the population, as it becomes more and more obvious that more people are against it. But finally, you radicalise the population against you by making sanctions the basic image of the West. And that's precisely what's happening now in Zimbabwe, where people are blaming the West for sanctions. If we had invaded Iraq in 1992, then the people wouldn't have been radicalised by a decade of sanctions against them. They would have risen up exactly as they did at George H. W. Bush's fall and not opposed the United States to the people that caused 120,000 children to die every year. Their idea of the transfer of power is wrong. We showed you that transfer of power will make the country worse now. Worse when it becomes a democracy if it happens, and worse for everyone because that population will be radicalised. This important motion must stand. The idea was, as the regime fragments, certain uh, generals have incentives to make deals with other generals to hold power. We think they also have incentives to make deals with the NDC to hold power. Because once the ZNPF knows that things are falling apart, as they know now, we think they have a larger part incentive to reach outside of the ZNPF for forms of alliance, which means reaching to more modern factions for forms of alliance. That's something they don't have in the event of a war. The only other analysis we saw was the idea that Morgan Chandra is going to take up arms himself. We think that this is radically unlikely given his past political performance, his past political ideals. And we think that even if he were to do this, it wouldn't uh, actually be as harmful as they bring about. But what we're going to talk about is three basic things. One, the harms of the war to the people of Zimbabwe, and why we think this is a reasonable calculus. Because the debate that the first uh, government wanted to have isn't the one we're having. We aren't saying, is it sometimes legitimate to breach a country's sovereignty? We're saying, is this a practically valuable breach of sovereignty that will help people? We admit that in certain cases, we can do this. The point is, should we? On what they've said is this will be a brief and technologically secure war, and they mentioned the Iraqi military conflict uh, preceding the insurgency. We're fine. Even if there were no insurgency, the very technologically superior American forces in Iraq completely obliterated the infrastructure of that country, meaning that Baghdad had no running water or electricity for months after. 
In the context of a cholerally, already impoverished country, we think the kinds of harms this has are disastrous and even more devastating. We also think that the reconstruction of Iraq after that war has been slow and disastrous, even in the context of America giving trillions of dollars, and even in the context of Iraq having a ton of oil. Uh, regardless of whose matter file is correct, Zimbabwe does not have a lot of oil, and there's no situation under which America will give as much uh, oil or as much money as was given to Iraq. So we think we will see the same kinds of harms uh, to the people economically and in infrastructure as have now. Things could tragically become worse in Zimbabwe. They aren't actually the lowest level. The other thing we're going to talk about, the other harm that we bring, is that Robert Mugabe's entire national idea of support has been in terms of a radically anti-colonial and nationalist nationalism, uh, supporting himself against foreign oppressors. This is why they worked so hard to paint the West as being opposed. In the context of a war which they admit to be bankrolled and technologically supported by Western powers, this gives Robert Mugabe exactly what he had for the last chance to be a hero to his desperately sad country. So that's in fact not what we think is that. The third thing they said is there won't be a certain change, there isn't, there isn't a lot of support. First of all, 28% support is actually quite a bit if you need insurgency. You don't actually need 100% of the population to take up arms. Uh, having a few million would be fine. We think that also, in the context of Zenithia having I mean, taken power as an insurgency, they have the military training, the military history, the history of, of anti-government to do this. We also think that when they say people are only loyal because they have been uh, given patronage to the land, uh, that's just one reason why people are loyal. Another reason they arose with the regime is they have bought into it. They have killed people for this regime. They have tortured people for this regime. They know they have no future in any conceivable and easy that regime. And so when their model is to invade and make Morgan Shangri uh, president, then everyone from the general to the soldier on down knows that their future is in uh, the court or being shot. They will fight because they've already done horrible things. They have an incentive to remain. No, thank you. We also think they're necessarily particularly well informed of their chances of victory. Robert Mugabe has incentive to lie to them about that and say they will win. Also, the African Union actually fights very poor wars and has a big chance of losing unless America actually does this for them. So we don't we, we neglect the idea that they will just lose. The other harm we say, we think this is significant harm to the opposition. We don't think Morgan Shangri survives the invasion. We think he gets knocked off pretty quickly when you stop throwing bombs because, as they said, he asked for them. So when we think this as the pro Morgan Shangri invasion, we think the opposition gets shot. Or, if they survive, they're tarnished by being linked to an invasion that will necessarily kill a lot of people. We don't think that they can then, we don't think that they can then take power in a way which will be accepted. We don't think the literacy exists. We compare this to, for example, the expats and other Iraqi leadership who tried to take power afterwards, but were then delegitimized for working with the Americans. Yes? So the most likely replacement set of here leader that your team named is Emerson Lenagogwa, who is also a war criminal. Why would he give up political power any more than Mugabe, particularly when Southern PF would still control the military, police, and media, and has shown a historical willingness to accept sanctions that hurt the people? Uh, so our incentive, uh, our idea is that Southern PF wants to share power, so they will eventually have to. They are moving in that direction, and we prefer they go there slightly slower and effectively and inevitably rather than forcing them. Some people won't ever want to give up. Some of them will. You make all of them into the latter category when you invade. Because this is what I want to talk about. They said it was ridiculous uh, to say that the Senate had both would fight for last and would also share power. We think that the only thing we have to argue to disprove this is that it's a different logical calculus when you're being bombed than the one where you're deciding to share more and more power. So, under our model, clearly the Senate had doesn't decide tomorrow to make Morgan Shanghai co-president. We think they slowly get more ministries, we think they slowly move forward. We're going to talk about examples in which this has happened in actual internal transitions. Because we saw no examples or no real analysis of why universally is the case that internal transitions are violent. Which is often in cases of aging dictators whose parties know they need to ditch them, you do see political change which is peaceful. We talked about Indonesia, in which the Suharto regime clearly linked to an elderly and flagging leader eventually gave power rather than fighting. We talked about it in Taiwan, which was also the case after Chiang Kai-shek's death. So our model probably may result in an interim in which a more modern Zanapia takes over and is then replaced by the NDC, but the NDC takes over legitimately the and therefore that works more effectively. We also think that it's harmful for the African Union to become involved in an invasion which harms its own principles of sovereignty, 
will not be accepted by other leaders. When they say they send a message to Omar al Bashir, we wonder why he would then allow the African Union to support such a message. Uh, we don't think that's reasonable. Even though it's a small group of democracies, they can do this, the African Union is not, and so it can't. We think you, you, you create danger for every other very valuable thing the African Union does when you link it into the very Western narrative of regime change. You delegitimize this African agency. So we support, we admit a slower, we think a more permanent, a more specific, and a more civilized transition in Zimbabwe. We know the change has to happen. We don't think lobbying expects this. In fact, it causes many harms, which we've added to. For that reason, this resolution must fall. I would just dispute that that was like a bloodless takeover. Thousands of people. 
We see whenever you invade a country, the regime not only carries out a struggle against you, but against elements within itself which, consider, which it considers supports you and whose aid you come to. Consequently, we say you endanger the lives of the members of the opposition. Consequently, we think you endanger that they're still in Zimbabwe, and we think that's a really, really bad thing. We don't think we want to impose more costs on an already a marginalized society than we have to. Consequently, we think it's not a very, very good idea to go ahead with this. But secondly, we tell you that you in many ways undermine the African Union. Now we accept that the African Union is a lot of good things. It's one of the few forms of cooperation within the region. It gives a lot of aid, it sends peacekeeping troops, it's a form for peaceful resolutions in the region. But we see it's premise on an assumption that countries are not going to interfere excessively in sovereignty. Why? Because a lot of the regimes that make up the African Union are countries like Sudan, are countries like India. Consequently, we think they will not like the fact that the African Union is acting in such a manner and will undermine their confidence, support, and willingness to engage with the institution. We tell you that in the context of Africa, that's a really, really bad thing, when it's one of the few forms which is actually working towards positive, positive goals within the continent, goals which you want to encourage and not undermine in, the, in this case and in the case of Zimbabwe. Because what you think that that's a good idea, I'll take over there. So can you explain how the AU has credibility to respond to conflicts or negotiate following regulations when there are no consequences for disregarding democracy? This case is important for all African people. No, but our point is not that. Our point is that the African Union that... cannot exist as a body that controls support within Africa if you make those principles central to it. The reason is because a lot of the regimes that make up the African Union who support the meaning of the aid in peacekeeping don't adhere to those values. We consequently tell you that just because you want to go to Zimbabwe, you wouldn't want to undermine confidence within the African Union itself. We think it's a good body, we think it does really good things, and then we don't do it, and consequently we're not going to basically, we think it's possibly a bad idea. Thirdly, I want to talk to you about legitimacy of new regimes when they're formed. And I want to bring two basic uh, different scenarios. Now, we say that if you invade, and if you go in, then the regime that has in power, presumably the movement for democratic change, will forever be tied to and pegged to, though that invasion and that movement of an outside force. On we think it undermines what the nationalist credentials of that basic organization, which is secondly all the costs that become associated with war, become associated with that organization and tied to it. And consequently, we see a lot of these parties then struggle to garner legitimacy internally, win elections in the future, and you end up undermining support for one of the few a few parties of genuine democratic change in the region that you have. We consequently think it's a bad thing. But also, we talk to you that very often regimes internally, after a death of a particular leader, or after a transition, move in positive directions. And we told you that this is something we see in Indonesia in 1997, and also in Cuba. The reason is because often dictatorial regimes are associated around one person, one individual, one cultural personality. When that individual just basically passes on, generally everyone are maybe more insecure about their position. This doesn't result in them fighting with one another, but often results in them being willing to make more compromises, reach more corporate settlements, and try harder to be some sort of contention. We tell you this is one of the reasons why Mugabe and his regime right now is already allowing members of the <laughs> movement of democratic change to hold positions in cabinet. They recognize that they're in danger. They recognize that after Mugabe and Mugabe leaves, they're going to have to open up and be more tolerant. And consequently, we think that is something we should wait for uh, rather than basically just rush into the situation. And so that moving on to that final thing. Three basic trends which we see right now. One, we see an opening up to for the movement of democratic change, opening up to positions in, uh, in the cabinet. We think that's one thing. Secondly, we recognize that Mugabe is near his deathbed. Thirdly, we say consequently all the time we indicate, indicate positive change. We think it's presumptuous and dangerous that in such a situation you risk a military intervention to all the harm to the civil states, especially when we tell you there are many reasons to be optimistic about Zimbabwe's future. So what have we shown to you, our opposition? We've shown to you this, this policy causes devastation and damage to Zimbabwe itself. It endangers the lives of opposition leaders. It delegitimizes the opposition forever. It undermines support in the African Union. It makes all the good things the African Union do, do more unlikely when all the states, such as Libya, such as Sudan, withdraw their support for the African Union. We gave you alternatives to why we think if we wait.
team built around individuals when they break up tend to become more tolerant and more open and more collective. And for these reasons, it comes to the growth of the issue. Thank you.